Venezuela is a fascinating case of a country heavily dependent on national re, uh, natural resource extraction and the effects that it has on the stability of the country, the lives of people within the country, and its relations with other states. Um, back, God, 15 years ago, I was doing a master's degree in Boston, and during the winters, uh, Hugo Chavez used to make a big show at donating heating oil to poor families in the Boston region as a way to show the benevolence of um, this Bolivarian um, autonomous uh, Latin American country and being able to support uh, the downtrodden in the capitalist U.S. Uh, system. Times have changed a bit since then, um, but the Venezuela has played a fascinating role in Latin American and North American politics. I'm not sure in the Australian case how many instances you have to talk about what's going on with Venezuelan poli uh, policies, but I think with the current instability with uh, in Ukraine right now, the U.S. has... Um, recently held meetings and U.S. officials flew to Venezuela for the first time in quite a while to talk with the Maduro government to see if there is a possibility to potentially uh, mend relations, potentially uh, end some of the sanctions that the U.S. put on Venezuela in the last couple of years and in, in some ways overlook our previous allies uh, who are the challengers to the current Maduro regime because of the need to try to increase um, oil production capacity. So I wanted to kind of highlight a couple of brief elements of Venezuela's ups and downs in their relation to natural resources uh, and conflict, as well as the political decisions that can make environmental factors salient to the likelihood of conflict. And then with the Financial Times a video and the Franz van Katka video uh, after this, that'll give you a more direct update as to what's actually going on in the country and how they got that way. Because again, it's hard without that kind of historical context and to see what people's lives have gone through in the last decade to have a sense of, of what might uh, the future have in store. So this is, yep, shows a bit about where Venezuela is. A couple of years ago, everyone was concerned that Venezuela was on the brink of an economic uh, collapse. And the uh, after the 2013 death of uh, Hugo Chavez, um, there was a lot of increased opposition to Maduro, a large number of people flowing across the border. But I think just in the last couple of years, um, the tide has turned, and I think Maduro's control has, um, has uh, reasserted itself in Venezuela to a certain extent. I think the, um, it, the dollarization uh, both officially and unofficially of certain parts of the uh, of society has helped reduce inflation, something we've talked about a couple of weeks ago, the importance of how it can make um, people's lives more or less painful uh, within a country. And I think that's kind of uh, stabilized. But it's also one of the largest refugee crises. Everyone's talking about Ukrainian refugees. Um, but in Venezuela, uh, more than 4 million people have been displaced. I think in one of the videos that you're going to watch after this, estimates are it's over 6 million now. Um, after Syria, it's the world's largest refugee crisis as of uh, a couple of years ago. I don't think that's changed substantially. And a lot of the international spending uh, on Syrian refugees vastly outstrips the amount of people that have flown over, uh, that have fled over the border to Colombia, uh, Brazil, um, and Guyana. And uh, the funding really just hasn't been there as much as it has been for other refugee crises. Um, that is often tied to the country's dependence on oil, which the videos show how um, Hugo Chavez was able to really make dramatic changes within the country and provide those goods to their own citizens. I remember 60 Minutes episodes in the U.S., the Venezuelan Youth Orchestra was one of the envies of the world, and the culture uh, and the ability, the, the resources to be able to in, improve the average Venezuelan's lives and enable them to have specialized education, in, including in... Um, uh, 
in um, in orchestras was a, a seen as a success from the oil wealth and that was easy to do for as you can see in this graph here of the uh, price of west, Te uh, west texas intermediate crude one of the benchmark uh, crude oil prices from that low after the economic crisis in 1998 you see a steady almost unidirectional climb from then for barrel of oil was costing less than 20 us dollars to um right before the economic crash of 2007 2008 of almost 180 dollars a barrel us that provided a huge i mean what is it nine times more resources um in uh selling the the oil and the taxation that flew to, uh, to the government it made it a lot easier when times are good to be able to spend on people's needs within the country however with the economic decline due to the financial crisis in 2007 and 2008 that took a hit um, and then in uh, subsequent years from 2013 everyone was talking about peak oil in 2015 um, and then with a coronavirus uh, pandemic it reached levels uh, almost not seen until the uh, early 1990s although now in the last year or two and definitely within the last couple of weeks there's been a huge balance pack in uh, the price of oil, which potentially could provide the Venezuelan government with more resources to be able to consolidate power, as well as provide some of those frozen chickens that they show in the video. But a couple of years ago, and it's hard to really get much press on it now, that's why I think that France Van Catcher video is really interesting to watch because it does see how Venezuelans live their lives, people who still are loyal to the Bolov Bolivarian ideal and to uh, the Hugo Chavez approach at governing Venezuela. And you see other one, others that are much more skeptical. I think it gives an on the ground look at um, the, the conflicting interests and priorities of different people within, within the same country. Uh, but yeah, a couple of years ago with inflation going in a similar direction to Zimbabwe and, and uh, uh, other areas of hyperinflation, Venezuela is considered, according to the Bloomberg Index, the most miserable country um, in 2019 and 2020. I couldn't find the 2001 um, edition. I need to sign up for Bloomberg costs a lot of money. There's a lot of different ways of trying to measure inflation. I, we talked about the Big Mac Index for currency exchange a couple of, uh, um, I think it was last week or the week before. Venezuela has the Cafe Con Leche Index, um, which I think I could see a lot more Australians sympathizing or finding more relevant than with the uh, the Big Mac index potentially. I've heard now with um, inflation really taking hold that uh, coffee prices are going to be headed up um, here as well, but nothing, nothing approaching that annual inflation rate of over 3,000% that Venezuela saw in, um, in 2020. So this dramatically makes the average person's life more difficult to the point in which you see press reports at saying that um, people are stealing zoo animals to eat them um, in Venezuela. That was back in 2017. So you see over over the last couple of years, from 2017 to 2020, a lot of stories of how desperate people were within the country. Soldiers caught uh, over the border begging for food. And you have to worry that when people who have the weapons or are tasked with security can't take care of their own human needs, that might lead to increased incentives for uh, corruption or um, a lack of rule of law. We're going to talk about the importance of that in um, in subsequent weeks as well. And then just leading to um, power outages becoming increasingly uh, common, which is really kind of amazing Which you have a country that has hydroelectric power, that has um, oil resources, that, that you have a situation that's dire, that these kind of basic human needs um, are still being uh, met, which can have um, health implications as well, including the spread of malaria, uh, murder and uh, raising uh, risk of protests. And this article from 2016 uh, was talking about rise in food protests. We're going to be talking about food pro protests in a few weeks. But I think now there's less of a talk than there used to be a couple of years ago in worrying about a slide towards civil war. Um, when the, um, the head of the uh, 
Venezuelan legislature was courting U.S. support and was forming this challenge, um, uh, challenging the center of power and the legitimacy of Maduro. There was a much more higher risk, I would, I would argue, given what we know in the literature, that the country would fracture between these two uh, powers. I think now with Venezuela's strategic importance raising and just in the last couple of weeks there is a potential to um to have um those factions even more sidelined and reduce of, uh, of conflict but time time will tell we'll see over the next couple months whether the ukrainian conflict changes domestic as well as international relations in uh, venezuela but yeah um I think a couple of things as you watch those videos, I'm interested to see your take for those of you who are filling out the um, lecture questions. Um, if Venezuela does slide into conflict, contra what I think a lot of people are talking about in the media and uh, amongst academics now, what is the potential explanation, right? In all of these conflicts that we're gonna look at in countries like Turkmenistan that avoided conflict, um, what's what's the reason what's the explanation for the national level outcome is it because of the decisions of individual domestic leaders is it the actions of international actors like u.s sanctions is it just the nature of the country the geology the geography where it is within the world or is it some other um, human security factor or um there's been cross-border tensions and funding and sheltering of rebel groups between Venezuela and Colombia going back decades? Is it the neighborhood that could have um, destabilizing effect? There's a bunch of other factors that you can look at, and it just shows the number of different potentially relevant factors and how important it is when we're trying to focus on one thing that we're recognizing that we're assuming away a whole bunch of other complexities to really get into more depth about a specific case. And so with that, I will be quiet. I hope you enjoy those two videos and I look forward to seeing you in the workshops. Have a great day.